Picture this. You're in a Boeing 747, cruising at 38,000 feet above sea level. When you feel the plane jerk, sputter, then come to a halt, that's when a voice comes on the intercom, calm with just a hint of panic. Passengers, fasten your seatbelts and brace for impact. Your heart sinks as you feel the plane begin to nosedive towards the unforgiving ocean. Oxygen masks drop from the ceiling, and the child beside you starts to cry as you try and remain calm. So, what do you do next? Or perhaps more importantly, what should you do next? Whenever we board a plane, we cross our fingers, maybe offer up a small prayer, and hope nothing goes wrong. But should the worst come to pass, a little bit of preparedness can go a long way. So remain in your seats and buckle up as we tell you what you can do to survive even the most brutal plane crash. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and make sure you stay tuned till the end to find out how far a human being can fall without a parachute and survive. Let's face it, flying can be a terrifying endeavor. One wrong move and you could find yourself stranded on a remote glacier in the Andes, with no food and water, forced to resort to cannibalism to survive. Okay, that's an extreme example, but it's not so far-fetched. In fact, it's exactly what happened to the passengers of Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571 back in 1972. Hearing that, it probably makes sense why at least 40% of passengers have experienced fear at one time or another when flying. After all, flying means sitting in a small metal tube hurtling through the clouds at just under a thousand kilometers an hour, which straight up sounds like a recipe for disaster. But fear not! Plane travel is actually really safe. The odds of something going wrong are around 1 in 11 million, which means you do way more dangerous stuff than fly every day, like riding an escalator. You don't get anxious before getting on one of those, do you? Or maybe you do. After all, if God wanted stairs to move, he would have given them legs. Besides, even if your luck runs out and you happen to be in that 1 in 11 million, odds are you'll still walk away from it, as most crashes have a 90% plus survival rate. Planes are frequently and rigorously tested by airline safety experts, who intentionally crash planes to assess their safety levels and see how things can be improved. But regardless of how safe planes might be, things can always go wrong. That's why it's best to be prepared. And preparedness starts with choices you make well before you even board the plane, like picking the right seat. Did you know that certain areas of the plane are safer than others? While companies like Boeing claim each seat is just as safe as the next, studies show that people who sit near the back of the plane are 40% more likely to survive a serious crash. Guess first class isn't all it's cracked up to be. In addition to picking a seat near the back of the plane, you'll want to pick an aisle seat five rows or fewer away from an emergency exit. Like we said, your odds of surviving a plane crash are really high initially. But fire and smoke can begin within 90 seconds of impact, so getting out of the aircraft ASAP can really make all the difference. While flight attendants are supposed to make sure passengers exit in a calm and orderly manner, we all know how emergency situations can cause panic and confusion. By positioning yourself near an exit, you ensure that you'll be one of the first people off the plane, increasing your survival odds significantly. Now that you're in your perfectly selected maximum survivability seat, you'll want to go ahead and make real familiar with the in-flight safety manuals airlines provide for you. Sure, some of the stuff in there might seem dumb, like how effective can the brace position really be against a 38,000-foot fall, but they're there because they're proven to work. For example, you'll want to keep your seatbelt on at all times, or at least when the flight crew recommends it. Things can get a little topsy-turvy when a plane crash is imminent, and you rarely want to find yourself out of your seat if it does. If so, you could find yourself crashing wildly around the cabin, injuring yourself and others. And that brace position we just mentioned? It's actually incredibly effective and increases your odds of survival significantly. The worst possible thing that can happen during a violent crash is that you get knocked out and are unable to take next steps like grabbing a life jacket or getting an emergency exit. The brace position is designed to protect your head from impact and stop your limbs from flailing around and potentially getting broken. So when the time comes to evacuate, you're capable of doing so. Some passengers try and fall asleep as soon as possible on flights. But for the love of God, make sure you don't sleep during takeoff or landing. These are the times when chances of a crash are at their highest. If you need a guideline, you can follow something called the 3-8 rule. Make sure you're awake and alert during the first three minutes and the last eight minutes of every flight. Oh, and speaking of God, if you're religious, you can always pray nothing goes wrong. While there's little evidence to support that this will do anything to increase your odds of survival, it couldn't hurt, and at the very least, it'll keep your spirits high. Take all this with a grain of salt, though. No two plane accidents are the same, and nothing we've mentioned guarantees survival. What saves one person may doom another. 
For example, Reddit user HighlanderTCB01 believes it was their decision to take off their seatbelt that allowed them to survive a deadly plane crash. Highlander was thrown clear of the wreckage rather than being buried underneath it, like the unfortunate passengers who chose to follow more standard safety procedures. Meanwhile, Erwin Tumiri, one of the six survivors of Lamia Flight 2933's crash into the Colombian mountains back in 2016, Tumiri stayed in his seat, buckled his seatbelt, and went into the braced position, while most of the other passengers panicked and got out of their seats instead, and credits his decision to follow protocol with his survival. So while there's always an element of randomness to any crash, the things mentioned in this video are intended to maximize your survival chances. Remember, 90% of plane crashes are survivable, and 76% of passengers will survive even the most serious crashes. But surviving impact is one thing. Surviving long enough to be rescued is another, while help will hopefully be on its way. Intense weather conditions can delay rescue operations by hours, if not days. Just ask Walter Wyatt Jr. Walter was in the middle of a violent thunderstorm when both engines of his personal plane went out, and he found himself plummeting towards the tempestuous ocean. Fortunately for Walter, he'd radioed for help earlier, and there was a search and rescue plane nearby. Unfortunately, the treacherous weather conditions meant the plane couldn't see Walter in the water. Walter was prepared. He had a life jacket, two flares, and had managed to remain conscious even after the crash. However, his flares were faulty. One sputtered out just seconds after he lit it, and the other one refused to ignite entirely. Unable to signal to the plane, he had to watch in despair as it circled overhead looking for him, then returned to its base to refuel. Walter's life jacket kept his head above the rough, choppy waves, but even that solace was short-lived, as the wear and tear of the event caused his life jacket to spring a leak. If that wasn't enough, Walter had cut his head during the rough landing, attracting sharks to his location. Walter spent over 15 hours at sea, desperately trying to keep his life jacket inflated, kicking away at circling sharks, and trying to remain calm against overwhelming odds. Eventually, the weather cleared, and rescue workers were able to find an exhausted Walter and bring him back to safety. If there's anything to be gleaned from this miraculous survival story, it's that preparedness and a will to live can help combat even the most overwhelming odds. Walter had previously taken a sea survival class, helping him stay calm even when lost at sea. If he was a little more prepared, he might have checked all his equipment before flying and found the faulty flares. But hey, we're not here to point fingers. Finally, his will to live allowed him to cling to life long enough for rescue workers to get to him, almost a full day later. Getting official survival training can be a game changer when it comes to overcoming catastrophe, especially since a plane crash will usually leave you in some sort of remote location. Take a course sooner rather than later, and like Wyatt Walter Jr., you might find it'll save your life. Odds are, things won't go wrong on your next flight. But if they do, just follow the survival tips mentioned in this video, and odds are you'll be all right. Of course, there are some flights out there, like Malaysian Airlines Flight 370, that straight up disappear. And to be honest, we're not really sure what to tell you there, since we're still not really sure what happened in the first place. Oh, and before we forget, it's Serbian flight attendant Velsa Vlovic that holds the world record for surviving the highest fall without a parachute. Vlovic was blown out of a plane at a whopping 33,000 feet above ground level, a feat so remarkable some people still think it's communist propaganda. Vlovic sustained heavy injuries and was hospitalized for several months, but managed to make an almost full recovery, proving just how resilient human beings are. Now, Volovic hadn't been planning on exiting the plane so early and had no plan in place for how to survive, but managed to do it anyways. It's just like how every Stranded on a Desert Island movie begins. A plane flies casually through the sky, you slink back in your seat enjoying the view, and there's no sign of trouble at all, except for those few rain clouds off in the distance. Suddenly, lightning strikes, the wind picks up, and the turbulence starts thrashing you around. You forget every safety procedure the flight attendant showed you, and soon, you're plummeting out of the sky like a fuelless rocket ship. Say goodbye to life as you know it! But wait, what's this? You managed to crawl out of the wreck? Something must have blocked your fall. How is that possible? Is surviving even possible? Oh, it's very possible. And here's how. First, let's ask Vesna Vlovic. She survived the longest fall in history without a parachute. Vesna was a Serbian-born flight attendant. It was a job she always wanted to do because she loved travel. But when the flight attendant test came around, she was worried she wouldn't pass due to her naturally low blood pressure. So she did what any 22-year-old did before a big test. 
and drank coffee after coffee until her blood pressure was high enough to pass the test. Which she did. Congrats, Vesna. You cheated the system and got the job. Hmm. If you think this story should end here with a happy ending, give us a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. Now, let's hear what happened. After eight months of flying, she boarded a flight from Stockholm to Belgrade. During the flight, a baggage explosion occurred and the plane began to fall. Now, normally if a giant hole appears in a plane, the sudden change in pressure will cause the body to, well, stop working and be in pieces. But Vesna managed to survive the fall with only two broken legs, three broken vertebrae, a fractured pelvis, broken ribs, and a fractured skull. She was walking again in 10 months' time. She also suffered amnesia, which made her forget the actual fall, and thus never developed a fear of flying. But back to the question at hand. Vesna, how did you survive? Are you a witch? A superhero? Maybe you anamorphed into a bird? Well, not exactly. It turns out the thing that almost prevented her from becoming a flight attendant saved her from the crash. Her low blood pressure, added to the fact that she was pinned to the plane by a drinks cart, allowed her to not be taken by the sudden change in air pressure. I don't know what's more impressive, that or the fact that she continued to, and in fact, loved flying until her death at 66. Vesna Volovic isn't the only one who survived Great Falls. Bear Grylls, the beloved TV personality and adventurer, survived a fall without a parachute. This fall was 16,000 feet, and Grylls totally intended on using a parachute. The problem was his parachute malfunctioned, so he went for his reserve parachute. A smart choice when plummeting to the Earth. Except that one malfunctioned too. Amazing luck, huh? But when he got to the ground, he survived. He's still kicking today. Now, he did break his back, which took a year to recover. But better than losing your life. So, how did he survive? Unlike most people in that situation, Grills had a second to think and used his parachute pack to break his fall. Like Volovic and the drink cart, having an object hit the ground before you absorbs the shock of the impact, making the crash less severe. And Grills didn't stop adventuring, no siree. He even said, sometimes it takes a knock in life to make you realize what you really value. I left that hospital with a fire inside to live life boldly and with gratitude. I had been given a second chance and that doesn't always happen. I guess we could all learn something from Grills, especially when your alarm goes off at 6 a.m. and you think there's no way you can survive another day at your job. Just remember, at least you're not falling 16,000 feet out of a plane with no parachute. Another young woman survived an 11,000-foot fall with two malfunctioning parachutes. Her name is Christy McKenzie. This was her 112th skydive, so she was a bit of an expert by then. But even that won't stop an accident like this. Despite a speedy plummet lasting about 45 seconds, McKenzie only suffered a fractured pelvic bone and a couple of bruises. And by what crazy miracle did she survive? Before hitting the ground, she landed on some power wires which slowed her immensely. She claims those power wires are what saved her life. Now this is some seriously scary stuff. So let's say you're in this kind of situation. How do you survive? Well, try using the Bear Grylls method. Use your parachute pack or another large object to fall on and absorb the blow. You might break every bone in your body, but you'll be alive. But before all this, if your parachute malfunctions or gets tangled, it's best to cut it off so the reserve doesn't get tangled in the mess. Avoid hitting the ground vertically, unless it's in water, then vertical is the way to go. And finally, aim for a bush or a tree or power lines. I know it's a lot to remember, but keep this in mind. There are about 10 million car accidents per year in the US. Parachute accidents? Per year, there are 21, period. So it's super unlikely that something like this would ever happen, especially if you stray away from skydiving in the first place. But these accidents do happen, and thankfully we can look to the brave survivors and the skills or luck they had in these falls. It seems either these people have superpowers, or what we think is the impossible isn't the impossible after all. So go out there, and don't be afraid of a little high-flying adventure. Have you ever walked by airport security on your way to your plane, eager to get on with your 12-hour flight, only to be confronted by a six-foot man in blue? You're left confused and a bit panicked. What crime could you possibly have committed? You notice too late the dangerous item in your hand, a 125-milliliter bottle of Fiji water. Don't worry, you aren't the only one. 
Thousands of travelers around the world have gone through the same experience you have, unable to transport their precious liquids through the terminals. However, none have probably come close to ending up in these three bizarre situations. In 2015, a Chinese woman drank an entire bottle of cognac at the Beijing airport. Not a joke. Instead of surrendering it to security, she pulled out the large bottle from her carry-on and proceeded to chug it dry in front of what would have been some pretty shocked and impressed onlookers. Unsurprisingly, she became too drunk to get on the plane and was taken by paramedics to a hospital to be given IV fluids. Now the case could be made against alcohol on a plane, but what could explain the crazy situation when a 13-year-old wasn't allowed to bring her insulin on board the plane? The incident occurred in 2018 at Manchester Airport, where the girl and her family were supposed to be flying to Italy on a relaxing holiday. She was stopped by security and told to separate her insulin from their sealed containers and package them in different bags. The young teen was even left close to tears after being told by a guard that her medicine could make the plane crash. True, some things that are potentially dangerous should not be allowed on a plane. The guards are just doing their jobs. However, that did not seem to be the case at all in 2009 when a UK man was stopped from flying over his bottle of water. But not his six inch serrated knife? What did these three people have in common? It wasn't alcohol, it wasn't medicine, and it definitely was not possession of a dangerous weapon that could have been used to hijack a plane. No, the one thing these strangers, and many others who've been stopped by airport security have in common is this. Over 100 milliliters of a liquid. Why is this an issue? Well, the American Transportation Security Administration, or TSA rules state, that any carry-on liquid or gels have to be stored in a 3.4 ounce or 100 milliliter container. They also have to be sealed in clear plastic bags. The UK Civil Aviation Authority, CAA, also possesses the same rules, with passengers having to store all 100 milliliter liquids in a one liter clear plastic bag. Most aviation departments around the world, such as the Australian Department of Transportation, ADT, and the Brazilian National Civil Aviation Agency, NCAA, enforce the same requirements with minor variations. What does this mean for flyers? This. Food items such as drinks, including alcohol, soups, syrups, and smoothies over 100 milliliters are not allowed to be taken on a plane. This poses a big issue for flight goers since a small Jamba Juice tops off at over 450 milliliters, while a short drink at Starbucks fills up at around 236 milliliters. Moreover, a small bottle of water typically contains four ounces of water, almost 120 milliliters for the rest of the world. Other items included in the ban are toiletries such as shampoos, toothpaste, conditioners, mouthwash, and other self-care products. Interestingly enough, if you have less than 100 milliliters of shampoo in a 300 milliliter container, it still violates the law and cannot enter a plane. Even aerosol sprays, such as deodorant and sunscreen, are included in this ban. Consequently, this law has some strange inclusions such as breast milk, pet fish, snow globes, and gel-filled toys, since all are liquids stored in containers or contain liquids themselves. But why go through all this trouble to ban liquids? Why make flying even more hectic than it already is? Security. It all comes down to the 2006 transatlantic aircraft plot. In 2006, a terrorist cell planned a complex attack targeting flights from the United Kingdom to Canada and the United States. Under surveillance by British intelligence, they were observed purchasing and recycling several chemical bottles and drink cans, leading to a search of their property and the discovery of a bomb factory. Scarily enough, the group planned to fill empty soda cans and bottles with hydrogen peroxide and use powdered orange to make it look like everyday pop. They would then team up on different flights to combine their liquids with explosive effect, using a common hair bleach to set off the compounds. Flights were cancelled and, in the coming days, carry-on luggage was strictly limited. The liquid limitations we deal with today would appear all over the world's airports due to this incident. 
However, said regulations would not stop terrorists from attempting to use liquid explosives again, as was the case in 2014, Russian authorities reported that a female flyer attempted to smuggle explosive materials mixed with her hand cream. The individual was planning to fly to Russia from France, presumably intending to attack the Sochi Winter Olympics. Another threat was also revealed with the United States Department of Homeland Security, who warned Russia that individuals were planning to smuggle toothpaste bombs into Russia. Another case made for the liquid ban includes drug smuggling. A Miami man was arrested after bringing on board liquid fentanyl and heroin. They were hidden inside shampoo and male enhancement bottles. Two questions have been asked. Are these measures actually effective? Many experts say no. Some explosive mixtures do not even require more than 100 milliliters of liquid, as seen with the Nigerian teen bomber. One report often states that all the components needed to make a dangerous solution can be purchased in small sizes in the airport's duty-free. Airport bought shampoos, shaving creams, lotions, and sprays can be mixed together for deadly effects. Are changes coming soon? They already have. It is important to remember that these measures were supposed to be temporary. They were specific reactions to a specific event. Roughly 12 years on, many groups are voicing their complaints with passengers complaining about the long wait times and intrusive security measures, turning what should be a simple two-hour flight into a five-hour ordeal. In response to these concerns, the TSA is considering new X-ray technology that will be able to detect harmful liquids in luggage and on passengers, with the CAA testing these same technologies. Moreover, duty-free zones in airports worldwide now offer security-approved packaging and products to buy before entering a flight, and regulations are loosening up regarding carry-on medicine. Do TSA agents make you sweat? Why should they if you don't have anything illegal you're bringing on a plane, right? You're just about done on your amazing trip to Switzerland. You saw the gorgeous Alps, had some delicious Appenzeller cheese, and got a new Rolex. Maybe even picked up a little bit of German, like Ruri Riste, which translates to kitchen cupboard. But as you approach customs, you can't help but think of all the crazy rules enforced by the airport. How much water can you bring on board? Does a flip-flop count as a weapon? Of course you're not harboring a dangerous pistol or a samurai sword, so you should be fine. But what's this? While your shoes and belts are off to go through the metal detector at the airport, the TSA agent spots something in your carry-on. This can't be! You're not a dangerous criminal! You're not a murderer! You're just an accountant on their annual vacation! Your brow sweats profusely and you say, Listen, you've got the wrong person here. And that's when the TSA agent pulls the dangerous weapon from your bag. The two-inch genuine Swiss army knife you got specifically engraved with your name as a souvenir. You plead, no, no, that's just something to bring back as a souvenir. I won't use it for bad. I'm one of the good ones. But it's too late. Just like that, you lost your precious souvenir. Since 2001, there have been strict guidelines to follow when boarding planes, like bringing no more than 3.4 ounces of liquid containers and packing them in all plastic bags. Some other items that can be confiscated include snow globes, gel insoles, and brie cheese. Since it's a soft cheese, it's considered a liquid and follows the 3.4 ounce rule. And a snow globe sometimes contains more liquid than that, not to mention the glass that could shatter and create weapons. But you can bring scissors, as long as they're under six centimeters and have rounded edges. Clearly, the TSA do have their insane precautions to ensure the safety of all passengers. Consider these items that have actually been confiscated by TSA agents. An old-timey war cannonball? Probably straight from a pirate ship. Snakes! That's right, Samuel L. Jackson would be furious if he knew about this one. A bottle of seahorses? Don't forget about that three-ounce rule, seahorse lovers. A life-size teddy bear. He had no drugs or weapons inside him. This cuddly friend was just too big. One guy even tried to get through with a stolen ancient artifact. A Newark traveler tried to smuggle a 5,000-year-old pot through from the Tang Dynasty. A sarcophagus has even been tried through airport security. There are also tons of weird things you're actually allowed to bring. You can bring ice skates, which are like literal knives attached to your feet. You can bring fresh eggs, a bowling ball, and even a cheese grater. So you can bring a cheese grater, but not the actual cheese. Yeah, got it. Another weird item you can casually bring on a plane? Try a Christmas tree. 
Just make sure it's tied up, because those pine needles might be mighty pointy. If you're one to smuggle a Christmas tree on a plane, give this video a thumbs up and hit that bell notification. So let's say you get caught smuggling that brie cheese back from a trip to France. One option would be to pull a Liz Lemon in 30 Rock and eat the whole thing before you go through customs. And if you're flying from home, you might get a nice TSA agent who will let you put your extremely dangerous weapon back in your car. Some airports even have mailing services where you can send your souvenirs home. You have to pay a fee, but isn't it worth it for those precious memories? Now what if they do take a snow globe away? A lot of the real weapons, like knives, go to police auctions to raise money for the precinct. Something like pepper spray would go to a police training academy. Officers in training all have this one magical day where you must get pepper sprayed, and you thought your school was bad. The reason behind it is so that every officer will understand that its use has effects. Some academies even do this with tasers, so if you bring one of those on board, it'll soon be in the hands of another cop. Something like scissors also gets sent to schools, but more for, say, you know, a second grade class. I hope there's no pepper spray in there. What about the big bad items? That's where the local law enforcement really takes over. Narcotics as well as food are brought to a secretly located incinerator. And those non-claimed food items can lead to a $1,000 fine. Other items may be melted or destroyed, never to be seen again, and you could be facing jail time. So that Swiss Army knife? Are the TSA agents just gonna sell something with your name on it? Well, yeah. They sell it in bulk, usually in a bag with other Swiss Army knives. So if you want your souvenir back, your best bet is to research police auctions nearby with all those Swiss Army knives rifling through until you find yours. But it's never a sure thing. Airports are kind of a mystery to the average flyer. The young boy's mother still doesn't know what happened when her two-year-old rode the baggage conveyor belt for five whole minutes. Lorenzo Vega stepped away from his mother in the Atlanta airport, and just like that, he was whisked away on a journey that before only baggage could tell. Whatever happened in there, Lorenzo got out with a fractured hand, so it may look fun to ride around on those conveyor belts, but like they say, it's all fun and games until someone fractures a hand. Okay, they don't say that. We just said that, but you know, don't do it. So the most important thing to remember is to make sure that you don't try to bring home seemingly harmless souvenirs from your trips. It'll only be a heartbreaking goodbye when they're taken away and sold to the highest bidder. Over a hundred years ago, Orville and Wilbur Wright, better known as the Wright Brothers, decided to give a giant middle finger to millions of years of evolution and give humans the gift of flight. F***ing birds, they probably said. They're not better than us. And they were right. Birds aren't better than us. We're better than birds. Or at worst, equals. Sure, our version of flying can give us skin diseases, mess with our sense of time, and make us swell up, but let's not get into that just yet. The thing is, since human beings aren't really, you know, meant to fly, there's a ton of unnatural things that happen when we hurtle through the air at hundreds of miles an hour, and we're gonna tell them to you. But first, make sure you like and subscribe to the Brainiac channel for more fly content. Haha, <laughs> see what we did there? We're sorry. Now then, did you know that, for example, you're just soaking up UV rays as you hurtle through the atmosphere? Yeah, at that altitude, your body is like a little UV sponge. And before you go sticking your arms by the windows trying to get a little tan going, remember that UV rays can cause intense sunburns, or worse. Plane captains bear the brunt of this, though, and for them, being in the air for an hour is the equivalent of being in a tanning bed for 20 minutes, but without the benefit of actually getting tanned. Want to know something else? Planes make you swell up. Oh, that's right, you'll swell right up like a ripe grape in one of those bad boys. That's mainly because flights tend to be lengthy endeavors, you know, traveling across oceans and such, and the air pressure plus lack of mobility involved being sat in a chair for several hours puts you at the risk of things like blood clots, and swollen feet and other stuff. An easy fix is to just make sure you get up and take some regular walks and stretch. You might feel a little bit awkward doing that in the aisles, but hey, beats being a balloon. Speaking of loony behavior, you probably don't want to make any major life decisions on an airplane. Cabin air has less oxygen than good old-fashioned earth air, which might make you feel groggier, foggier, and uh some other word that ends in augur that we can't think of right now. Dog ear? Sure, let's roll with that. If you want to pretend like you just didn't hear that last thing we said, a plane is the perfect place for you to be. The air pressure change on planes makes our ears freak out, and it's super common for people to experience ear discomfort and muffled hearing during a flight. You know that kind of muffled hearing that might make somebody want to click that notification bell above just so they can make sure they know what's going on? Huh? Wink wink, nudge nudge. Anyway, yawning and chewing gum are another good way to make that feeling go away. 
way. So don't be weirded out if you look around your plane and everybody's got their mouths open, unless they're also screaming in terror, in which case, baby, that plane's going down. The idea of an airborne accident tends to make people nervous, but don't sweat it. No, seriously, don't sweat. You'll need all the moisture you can. Airplane humidity levels are typically lower than 10%, which means you're drying up like a mermaid in the Sahara. Drink tons of water and use moisturizers if you want to keep your skin silky smooth. The drinking lots of water thing should help with that cotton mouth feeling people get on planes too, which occurs because of the dryness and pressure changes. Which actually presents a controversial thought. Maybe airplane food is actually delicious, but our tongues are just too incapacitated to realize it? Now that's some airplane food for thought. Ugh, sorry again. And of course, it's about time we mention the consequences that come along with flying through global time zones. Your body's sensitive and sophisticated internal clock gets completely fucked up going on long distance flights, which results in a little thing called jet lag, AKA laying awake in your hotel room at four in the morning because you can't sleep. So all this doom and gloom might have put you off of flying forever, but let's get real guys. Dry mouth, swelling, and jet lag can totally suck but they shouldn't be enough to put you off from enjoying the modern miracle that is man's ability to fly, which has led to an unprecedented cultural change and, more importantly, trillions of dollars of global trade to Ching. But the ability to tell birds to go f*** themselves? Priceless.